Hello, everyone. Welcome to the CIN webinar on engaging patients in substance use disorder treatment. I'm Marie Hubbard, and I'm the project manager for CIN. For those of you that don't know uh, about CIN, CIN is a network of quality improvement leaders focused on innovation in healthcare. It's a program funded by the California Healthcare Foundation and uh, administered by Health Force Center at UCSF. Uh, a few pieces of logistical information. Everybody will uh, be muted for this webinar. Um, if you have any questions you'd like to ask Dr. Stockton, please put them into the chat function and we will get to as many questions as we can within the hour. I would now like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Candy Stockton from Humboldt IPA, one of CIN's partner organizations. Um, a quick reminder, this webinar will be recorded um, and we encourage you to share this resource widely within your networks after the webinar. So Dr. Stockton, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Marie. So just quick sound check with Marie. Sound still working well? Yep. Excellent. Okay, so I'm really excited about the opportunity to talk with you today about how to effectively engage people with substance use disorders in treatment. And you'll notice that that's a mouthful and it's a deliberate mouthful. Um, when we talk about treating people with substance use disorders, we think of this as a very different process or a very different disease than most of the things that we treat in medicine. And in fact, the things that I'm going to share with you today are really kind of drawing parallels between how engaging patients with substance use disorder in treatment is no different than how we engage other patients. Your staff already have the skills to do this. We're just going to work on shifting your mindset a little bit and your paradigm so that you see the parallels between treating this and, and other diseases. So when you're working with patients with substance use disorders, the words that you use matter. There's a big difference between saying somebody is a person who's struggling with or has a substance use disorder and saying that somebody is an addict. Addict carries a whole lot of emotional baggage and a whole lot of judgment that really kind of closes the door on treatment and, and on forming a relationship right at the time that you use it. We know that, we make an effort not to refer to people as diabetics anymore, but people with diabetes, because we try not to define people by their medical conditions, we try to think of their medical conditions in light of their personhood. Um, and that same approach is important when dealing with substance use disorders. Your attitude really matters. If you are internally judgy or biased against people and you think that this is inherently a moral problem or a moral failing, patients, no matter what words you use, patients are going to pick up on that and they're gonna to respond to that. So if, if that is something that you struggle with as a provider, as a healthcare worker, or somebody in the extended healthcare fields, you need to spend a little bit of time thinking about your own biases and your own motivation, or you're not gonna make a lot of progress with people. And then last piece is what I already referred to. It's just, this is a chronic disease. Use the same chronic disease models that, that are um, beneficial for treating other conditions. So you'll notice this is a picture of actually my children and my husband. And for those of you who are a little on the nerdy side, you might recognize that this is in Hobbiton, um, the Green Dragon Inn. If you don't understand what that is, don't worry, it's a Lord of the Rings reference. But, but I think it's important for us to keep some kind of picture of somebody that we care about, somebody that we love in mind when we're talking about people who suffer from substance use disorders, because part of interacting with them and treating them is remembering that they're somebody's children, they're somebody's parents, they're somebody's loved one, and seeing them as human beings first who have a disease rather than as a disease is so important in driving how we communicate with and interact with them. So what I'm going to use today is an illustration of what not to do. I was fortunate to have parents who read to me a lot as a child, and this was one of my favorite books. Papa Bear tries to teach his son how to ride a bike, but ends up just demonstrating over and over again what not to do. And I'm going to use that model to go over what not to do when working with people who have a substance use disorder. And to reframe this for you and kind of remove some of the emotional judgment that occurs when we're talking about addiction, I'm going to do that with a different disease. 
diabetes. I like the corollary of diabetes because like addiction, it is a chronic disease that has lifelong implications. It's a complicated disease process. It's affected by genetics, by your environment, by your choices, but it's not singularly one of those things. And it is a for, for those of you who work with people who have diabetes, it's often an up and down condition. You can be doing really well for quite a while and then something can happen and throw you off your game and you can slip up and be sort of back to poorly controlled diabetes again. So it's a really good model. And most of us don't have a lot of strong emotion or a lot of inbred biases around people with diabetes. So it makes it kind of a safe area to have this conversation. So what not to do in caring for patients with with substance use disorders. So we're gonna start with the story of Miss Smith and give me just a minute because I'm not sure if you're seeing it, but my screens are there. My slides were partially blocked on my screen. So this is Miss Smith. She's a 34 year old female and she has type two diabetes. She didn't know she had diabetes until she was hospitalized with complications. She hasn't had any medical care for the last five years. Her A1C is 14. For those of you who don't do diabetes care, that's a measurement of her average sugar levels over a two to three month period. And you want it to be under 6.5 to 7 range when you're seeing somebody with diabetes um, to help prevent complications and lower health problems associated with that. Because of the health problems associated with her poorly controlled diabetes, she's been out sick for many days, so she lost her job um, for too much absenteeism. So, so this is Miss Smith. So now imagine that I'm the doctor who's seeing Miss Smith either in the hospital or when she's released from the hospital for follow-up. And I say to her something along the lines of, you're not even trying. Come back when you're serious about making changes and then we can work with you to help you get better. Um, and how do you prove you're serious? Well, you need to quit eating all junk food and you need to start exercising five days a week. And when you've made those changes, I'll know you're serious about getting treatment for your diabetes. And then maybe I'll prescribe you some metformin or some insulin to help with that process. Um, or I came in and I write her a prescription for medicine, but then I tell her this insulin is just not going to help you get better at all if you don't stop eating junk food. So I don't even know why you're coming in for treatment. It's silly to waste my time giving you medicine when you don't care enough to change your diet. Or I'll prescribe insulin for you, but only if you commit to going to diabetes education classes five days a week for two hours a day for the next six weeks. If you don't do that, I'm just not gonna be able to write you a prescription for medication. Or maybe I'm good with the patient and I say the right things to the patient in the room, but then I walk out in the hallway and say to my nurse or my medical assistant, oh, these patients are so frustrating. They just don't wanna get better. They keep coming back over and over again and they don't do any of the things I tell them to do. Most of us have probably watched medical staff members or even physicians interact poorly with patients. And I think most of you can imagine how likely Ms. Smith would be to come back if I said any of those things to her about her diabetes. But in essence, we do this all the time to patients who have, who have substance use disorder. We say, well, if your urine tox test when you come in is clean, another judgmental word, then maybe we'll put you on buprenorphine for helping to treat your addiction. Or, yeah, I know we're, we are gonna try prescribing medication for you, but it's not gonna help you if you keep using. So if you have a slip up this week, I'm not sure that I can write you this prescription again. Or I'll prescribe you medication, but only if you go to intensive outpatient counseling for your substance use disorder. And that for, for intensive outpatient counseling involves contacts basically five days a week with the treatment center. And in theory, that would be a good and supportive thing. But for many patients, including maybe Mrs. Smith, who needs to get back to work, um, that can be a barrier that they just can't do. And none of us would tell our diabetic patients, we're going to cut off your medicine if you don't go to diabetes education. We would encourage, we would try to support, we would come up with alternative forms of diabetes education if there was a scheduling barrier, but we would never tell them, sorry, no insulin for you. Um, and, and certainly, even if we say the right things to patients when we're in front of them, but then we walk out in the hallway and say something negative about that patient, it's not all that uncommon for them to hear that. 
I, like many providers, have been caught making comments in the hallway over the course of my career that I wish I hadn't said and I wish the patient hadn't heard. And it definitely does affect your relationship with the patient and your ability to help them when, when you do those things. So you want to be really conscious of the communication choices that you make, not just because the patient might hear you, but because when you make those comments a lot, it affects the attitudes of your staff towards dealing with those patients as well. And that's gonna be reflected in the way that they, if, that they interact with patients. I'm gonna take a very brief pause here and ask Marie if, if there are any questions she wants me to stop and answer after this slide. We don't have any questions yet, but this is a good reminder for those on the call to please feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar. Um, you can put them into the chat function uh, and we will stop and answer questions periodically throughout the hour. So, I didn't do any of those things with Ms. Smith, or I did and she came back in spite of them because she really does want to get better. So I'm seeing her for follow-up six weeks later. Her A1C has come down from 14 to 10, which is still several points too high, but it's a big improvement. She's exercising three days a week. Remember, I wanted her to exercise five days a week, but three days a week isn't bad. Um, it's more than I make it to the gym most weeks. She didn't make it to nutrition classes because they were only offered um, in the afternoon after school got out and she doesn't have childcare right now to watch her kids and she couldn't take her kids with her to the nutrition classes. She did take her insulin every day and she followed the diet that we recommended about 20 out of, of 30 days a month. So all in all, with my patient with diabetes, I would look at that and I would say, wow, Ms. Smith, you have made a lot of improvements this month. You've lowered your overall sugar values, you made it to the gym three days a week, you followed your diet more often than not, and you took your medication every day. That is great progress. I'm really proud of you. You should be really proud of yourself. I know that wasn't easy. What are some of the things that helped you do that this month? You know, how could you use those things to make even more progress next month? And that's what I should say. And it's what most of your providers probably do say in the face of somebody who has diabetes. However, if I treated you like a patient that we treat for addiction or substance use disorder, I might say something along the lines of, that's very disappointing. You didn't actually meet any of the goals that we set for you this month. You're obviously not trying hard enough wow, you didn't go to nutrition classes, I'm not gonna be able to prescribe insulin for you anymore. And any other number of comments that you can kind of reframe that you've heard to people, made towards people who are trying to get treatment for their addictions. And we would never say that to somebody with diabetes. In fact, it would be considered malpractice to actually threaten to cut off the insulin of somebody who didn't completely follow your, your uh, recommendations for this month, but was actually compliant with and making progress in treatment. So, so we would never even consider that type of a response to somebody with diabetes, but we do that all the time to people with addictions. Instead of focusing on following the appropriate diet 20 out of 30 days or abstaining from drug use 20 out of 30 days, we say, wow, you used 10 days this month. That's terrible. That's so much. Why am I writing you this medication if 10 days this month you still use drugs? Um, yeah, I know you took your medicine and I know that you're, I know you didn't use drugs as much this month and I know you took your medicine every day, which is a big commitment but you failed the drug test today, your drug test was dirty. And, and so I'm, even though you're doing better and even though this medication is helping to move you in the right direction, I'm just not gonna write it for you anymore because you didn't meet all of the guidelines that we set for you. You didn't go to the counseling classes, you didn't have a clean drug screen this month, I can't prescribe for you anymore. And that's a, that's a common response in doctor's offices to patients who are in treatment for their addiction. So Mrs. Smith, Ms. Smith somehow manages to plug through that and she comes back anyway, even though I've clearly done nothing to build rapport or be supportive with her. And at this visit six months later, she's gotten her A1C down to 7.2. Remember the goal was less than seven. Um, 
and she's exercising three to five times a week. She gets at least three times every week, and when she can, she gets up to five times a week. She's actually gotten a new job, and she hasn't had to miss any sick days in the last four months, so her attendance has been great, and her boss is really happy with her. She usually follows her diabetes diet pretty perfectly, but this weekend she went to a wedding, and she had cake and champagne, and her sugar is a little high in the office today. Um, Again, this is not an uncommon setting for somebody who has diabetes, right? And generally, what I or other providers would say in response to this was, wow, you did an amazing job the last six months. Look how much progress you've made. You've gotten your A1C down from 14 to basically at goal. That's really going to lower your risk of developing kidney failure and blindness and other complications. Um, you're exercising several times a week, you found a new job, you haven't had to call out sick, you followed your diet almost perfectly. Everybody has an occasional slip up and, you know, has birthday cake or goes to a wedding. That, as long as that's a rare occurrence for you, as long as it's not happening on a daily basis, overall, you are so much healthier and your health outcomes are going to be so much better. You should be really proud of yourself. I consider this an acceptable diabetes outcome. Now we just have to work with you to help you figure out how to keep this up because it's hard work to keep it up forever. And that's generally what we would say to Ms. Smith. So she comes in looking a little embarrassed over her weekend slip up and we say, no, no, amazing job. We are so proud of you. If you're that same patient and you came in after that episode and the doctor said something along the lines of, how could you do that? We worked so hard to get you better. That was so stupid of you to have cake and champagne this weekend. You know better. Why did you even go to the wedding? You know other people are going to be doing that there and, and you're going to be tempted. So why would you even go to the wedding? Why didn't you just skip the wedding? Um, we say, Marie, I'm getting an awful lot of feedback. That should be better. Okay. <laughs> Um, say, why bother to take your insulin if you're going to do that? I mean, if you're just going to go to a wedding and eat cake, you might as well just forget your insulin. There's no point in even taking it. Or, I can't waste a space in my diabetes program for someone who isn't serious and isn't trying. You know, I only have so many of spaces, so many spaces in my program for people with diabetes, and you're not really using yours effectively, so I can't waste a spot on you. You're not worth it right now. Again, you can imagine saying those words to somebody with diabetes in this situation, and I think that probably most of you can't even imagine a provider saying that to a patient. That would be so inappropriate. But again, we say that to patients who have addictions all the time. They have a traumatic event in their life and something happens and they have a slip up and they come in and they test positive for a drug of abuse on their drug screen and we say, wow, aren't you trying? I mean, you've been in this program for months now and we've spent so much time working on it and we have really invested a lot of energy in you and I, I can't believe you did that. You let us down and we really can't afford to take up a space in our treatment program for somebody who isn't trying and you're just obviously not serious about this. Or you should have known if you went and hung out with that friend or that family member, you went to that family reunion or that anniversary or that birthday party that other people were going to be using and you would be tempted to use too. So you should have just skipped it. You shouldn't have spent time with those people who are important to you and part of your life because you're going to use if you do that and then we won't be able to treat you anymore. So, so reframing that, you know, we would never say that to a person with diabetes in this situation, but we say that all the time to a person with a substance use disorder in this situation. And I'm going to pause again, Marie, and check and see if there's any questions you want me to address. We still, uh, we, we don't have any questions at this time. Perfect. So, Mrs. Smith is now coming in for her one year follow up. She actually managed to go to the six weeks of diabetes education classes. She's taking her insulin and now metformin because she needed a little bit more medication. She's taking them every day. She's actually exercising 30 minutes every day after she drops the kids off at school. She goes to the gym before she heads to work. 
Her diet isn't perfect. She's got a limited food budget. It's hard for her to buy a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables. So she eats more processed foods and carbs than she probably should, but it's the best she can do with the resources that she has. And her A1C is now 6.8, which is in the range that, that we're shooting for to decrease the risk of health complications from her diabetes. Because notice, we never thought we were gonna cure her diabetes. What our, what our aim was, was to help her control her diabetes to decrease the health costs to her and the change, decreases in quality of life that are associated with that. So we're not trying to cure her diabetes. We're trying to prevent her from developing kidney failures, wound, kidney failure, wounds on her feet that don't heal, blindness, early heart disease. We're trying to prevent the consequences of having poorly controlled diabetes. So. Ms. Smith came into my office at this point, I would say, wow, this is amazing. You've made great changes in your life. How do you feel? Do you feel better? Is this working for you? What are some challenges that you expect over the next couple of months? Are there things that might be hard for you? Are you having a change in your schedule or your job that might change your ability to get to the gym? Are there any issues with childcare or your kids' schooling that might make this difficult for you to maintain? What can we do to anticipate challenges for you and help you keep your diabetes under this good of control because you're doing great? And nowhere in that conversation would I suggest that she should just stop her medication because it's been 12 months and she should be better now. Nowhere in that conversation would I take for granted that this wasn't a lot of work on a daily basis for her to maintain. Um, but if I was treating her like I treated a patient with substance use disorder as they're commonly treated, I would say to her, great, fabulous job, it's been a year, it's time to stop your medication. And that's a typical response to those patients. Early guidelines talked about treating medically for a period of 12 to 18 months and then stopping medication. Insurance companies often want you to designate when you start treating somebody how long they're going to they're going to need to be on medication. And they generally want a detailed explanation of why that's the case if you think they're gonna be on longer than 12 months. Um, so, so we have a system that's built around the idea that we will cure people with addiction and that 12 months of treatment with medication is enough to change all of the complex genetic, environmental, and lifestyle factors that are involved in the disease of, of addiction or substance use disorders. And we have this preconceived notion of how long we should treat patients. In reality, we would never do that with somebody who had diabetes or hypertension. Now, what we might do if that person was doing well is sit down with them and say, wow, you've made a lot of lifestyle changes. How confident do you feel in being able to keep those up? Are there any challenges for you that you anticipate? Maybe we should try lowering your dose of medication um, to see if that's still working for you. Right? And, and it's perfectly appropriate to do that with somebody with substance use disorder as well. It's perfectly appropriate to say, wow, you've done a lot of work around this in the last year and you've gone to counseling and you haven't really had any slip ups with use in the last you know, six or nine months. And how are you feeling about this? Would you like to try moving in the direction of getting off of medication? Would you like to try decreasing your dose a little bit and see how you do? Um, and we would follow up and see if you're still doing well or if you're starting to struggle with cravings and desire to use again if we lower the dose. And in much the same way that we might say to somebody with really well-controlled diabetes, wow, you've made a lot of changes. I'm really impressed with the way that you're doing. I know that you didn't want to be on insulin forever when we started treatment. How about if we try decreasing the dose a little bit and see if you can still control your blood sugars doing that? How about if we start working in that direction? So, so we need to be much more conscious of the chronic disease model, the idea that we are not curing addiction. And there's a complex factor or a play, interplay of factors that contribute to this. And if somebody lives in an environment with a lot of substance use, it's unlikely that they're going to be able to 
stay abstinent, to stay away from using substances without leaving that environment. And to move outside of my diabetes analogy and, and to use a different one that I like to use with my students and residents, if, if I said to you, Joe, I have really bad news, you have, you have cancer, it's a progressive terminal cancer, there isn't really a treatment that we can do for you here that's going to, that's going to cure you or, or save your life, but I have good news. There is this one treatment for this cancer that you can do. You have to go live on a mountaintop in Tibet. You have to meditate 10 hours a day, and you can never be in contact with any of your family or friends or other people that you know from back home. Most of the time, Joe would look at you and say, well, that's, that's nice, Doc, but how long do I have if I stay in my life and with the people that I love? And we wouldn't think that was a weird response most of us wouldn't find life worthwhile if to maintain our health, we had to live in an isolated environment with no contact with the people that we love. And there is a very good chance that your patient who has a substance use disorder has multiple other people in their lives who also have substance use disorders, whether it's parents, siblings, children, friends, their social circle, everybody at work, and most of them have neither the ability or the willingness to cut, totally cut all of those people out of their lives. And it's unreasonable of us to expect that they would. Most of us wouldn't give up our children, wouldn't give up our parents. We might give up our siblings, depends on the day, um, but wouldn't give those things up to stay drug free. And yet we get upset and offended with patients when they keep putting themselves back in situations around other people who are using and make them at risk for using again too. So for people in that setting, staying on medication long-term can be really the only way that they have a chance of staying abstinent because they're surrounded by temptations and situations where, where that's an issue for them on an ongoing basis. And that's true for our low-income patients who have diabetes as well. They don't really have a budget that allows for them to buy the type of food that we think is appropriate for a diabetes diet. And, and so they're going to need some medication to help offset for that. We can help them do the best they can with the resources that they have but we're not ever going to make their diet perfect to the point where they don't need medication to compensate for that for most of them. So again, Marie, I'm going to pause and see if you have any questions for me. Um, still no questions at this time, but for those of you who jumped on um, a little bit later, just a reminder, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat box and uh, we will ask them as we go. Perfect. So to kind of summarize what we've talked about, you and your staff, you already know how to engage people with chronic disease. You already know how to support them, how to look at their strengths and their challenges when they're going through treatment. And we understand, if not intuitively, then at least through several years of practice, how to help people navigate those challenges, how to support them in their strengths and help them build fail safes for their weaknesses or their factors that they can't change about their life. We know how to do that. We simply haven't really bought into the idea that addiction is a chronic disease yet. We still internally hold on to this idea that this is more of a choice, it's more of a chronic failing, it's a matter of willpower or moral fortitude, and so we hold on to these interactions, this way of working with these people that reflects that. And if we really truly adopted both compassion and a chronic disease model when we were working with patients with use disorders, we would treat them the same way we treat patients with diabetes, the same way we treat patients with asthma, the same way we treat patients with congestive heart failure, and we would recognize that there are ups and downs in treatment and that that's a normal part of the disease process. We wouldn't penalize patients for having a bad day of sugar control 
or a missed day with their rescue inhalers, or they forgot their diuretic one day with their congestive heart failure and they, and they put on a couple of pounds of water weight, we would recognize that that's a normal part of the disease process. And we would support them through that and build systems that supported them through that. We would use the same compassion when we speak to them and when we speak about them that we speak to other, that we use when we're talking about other patients who have chronic diseases and have a lifelong struggle with that. So that's kind of wrapping up the end of my material for today. Um, but I just want to stress that, that you already know everything you need to know to engage people with substance use disorder if you use the same tools that you use for other chronic diseases. We have one question. Um, what are ways that you track and report on engagement as well as growth or habit change in your, with your patients? Yeah, so that's a little harder, right? Because you can't measure an A1C that gives you a, a three-month summary of, of overall behavior. Um, this comes back to, to a trust-based approach with patients. So we look at external measures. If they were struggling with work or unemployed, have they been able to actually go back to work or be more consistent in their work attendance? If they've lost custody of or engaged in custody battles around their children because of their use, um, are, they, are they making progress with that or have they been able to get their children back? On a more short-term basis, Actually, attendance is the big one that we use. So many programs, if not most programs, in the early stages of treatment require people to attend weekly just for their medication appointment. Um, and that's a big lift if you think about how difficult it would be for you to get to the doctor's visit every week. Um, so, so just the process of showing up and tracking attendance can tell you a lot about how engaged people are in the beginning, how you know, how consistently they are to showing up for their one week follow up appointments. Um, did you have specific questions about other markers? We don't use urine toxicology screening as a marker of success. That's gonna reflect what the patient did in the last two to three days. It tells you nothing really about the quantitative value of, of how much progress, how decreased the patient's overall drug use has been. Um, I do sometimes with patients ask them how much they're spending as a way to get a to get an idea of change. So they'll tell me they bought like a dime bag of something and, you know, they bought three of those, they bought four of them or they bought whatever. And I say, okay, well, you know, what day was that on? When did you have to buy another one? Um, and sometimes that's a way that people can be a little bit more accurate and reflecting how much they're using in the way of drugs, it's hard for people to give measures. They don't measure out how many milligrams or um, total quantity, but, but looking at spending patterns on drugs over time or alcohol as well can, can be effective. Great, and there's a, another question. So it's a, it's a two-pronged question. At what point um, do you see this continued use of substances, i.e. Suboxone, um, as not reducing harm? Um, and ha have you seen success in, uh, with contingency management? So let me break that down. So long-term harm of Suboxone um, or buprenorphine products. I am completely aware of the fact that we don't really know what the 20, 30, 40 year outcomes are on people who have um, been maintained on buprenorphine for that long of a time period. We do know a few things about buprenorphine though. We know that it doesn't overactivate the opioid receptors in the brain, so it doesn't cause production of more and more opioid receptors driving worse and worse addiction. It also other than the first introductory phase, the first couple of days in somebody who's opioid naive, it doesn't cause euphoria or a high. Most people who take it will actually have that conversation at some point. They're like, oh, I took a little more and it didn't, didn't do anything. It didn't help me get high. It didn't have a change. It has a significantly lower risk of causing respiratory suppression or interactions with other drugs that would lead to death. So, so it is true that we don't yet know what happens to people who stay on the medication for decades. 
we know that there are consequences associated with being on insulin for decades, but we also know that poorly controlled diabetics don't live decades without insulin in the first place. And we know with um, particularly opioid use disorders that people who have an opioid use disorder, their life expectancy is on average 20 years shorter um, than their cohorts who do not have an opioid use disorder. So we don't truly know what the long-term effects could be at this point, but we know what the short-term effects of not treating are. It's that you don't live long enough to find out what the short-term or what the long-term effects are. And then there was a second piece to that question, and I'm sorry, I've forgotten what it was. Marie, could you give me the last piece? Oh. Yeah, the, before we get to the second part of that question, um, there was a, a modification or clarification around the question, which is um, this relates to co-use of illicit substances, so um, uh, heroin and yes. use of or, or probably what the person's asking is, so they're in treatment for their heroin addiction with buprenorphine and doing well in terms of their heroin use, but they continue to use methamphetamines. I'm, I'm thinking that's probably what the question actually is. And there is not, there's both a simple and a very complicated answer to that. The simple one is you wouldn't not treat somebody's diabetes because they're not taking care of their asthma. Um, and and the, the same is true in this. There was initially, and when I started doing this 10, 11 years ago now, I would fire patients who used methamphetamines and continued using them as they went through the program. Um, because I said to them, what is the point of me treating one addiction if you're just going to kill yourself with the other? I'm not actually helping you lower your risk. That represented my early lack of understanding of the differences between opioid addiction and methamphetamine addiction, and also the underlying drivers for addiction. That's more of a mindset of addiction is bad and addiction is a choice, and if you're not choosing not to use the methamphetamine, why should I treat your other addictions? Um, that is complicated, and we now see that there is a decreased risk of death in treating people's heroin addictions, even if their methamphetamine addiction is not well controlled. And that leads into what the second piece of the question is, I think, around what are experiences with contingency management? Yep. Okay, and contingency management, um, for those of you who don't know, because to me, contingency management means like, you know, thinking of what things could go wrong and preparing for it, helping people prepare plans for that. But contingency management in the field of addiction actually means essentially paying people for the appropriate outcomes that we want. That's oversimplified, but that's what it means. So for instance, having a small reward that somebody gets um, when they come in and they have an appropriate urine tox or urine tox that's negative for methamphetamines. And that's used predominantly in treatment of stimulant disorders for a couple of reasons. One, because we don't have any effective medications at this point that help manage and reduce the, the complications and the problems around stimulant addiction. And the second is philosophically that it is the only thing we know of that's been shown to be somewhat effective probably because that little bit of dopamine surge for a small reward um, is sort of equivalent to the dopamine surge that happens when you use a methamphetamine, that you're looking for that positive surge response. And the rewards that they're talking about are generally small rewards. So like a gift certificate for a Starbucks coffee or whatever your local coffee shop is. And Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of experience with actually implementing those types of programs because there are some limitations around um, payment models for that. As you can imagine, it's a touchy subject politically to, to propose like paying people to not use drugs, uh, which, is, which is how it's viewed by many people. I can tell you that we did something a little bit similar to that. We had a stash of candy bars, full-size candy bars, that we would pass out when people hit a certain landmarks in treatment. And it was, it's very impressive how excited a 30 or 40 year old person will get about, about winning or, or not winning, but getting a merit-based gift of a candy bar for a certain, meeting a certain landmark or performance. So, so my, my anecdotal experience with that matches what's seen in the literature that that's an effective way to motivate people, but I don't have um, much personal experience with that because of the payment limitations and the funding limitations in the locations where I worked.
Great, we have another question. Um, uh, how do you manage those in those patients with personality disorders? Um, and, and what resources have you found useful? Patients with personality disorders are particularly difficult to manage um, with, with addictions. Um, one of the things that I try to remind myself constantly is that that behavior is frustrating and annoying as I find it. <coughs> Excuse me. Is a survival mechanism for that patient. It's actually helped them to survive to this point. And so it shouldn't be surprising that they continue to use those behaviors because it's what's kept them alive until now. Working in conjunction with counseling, if that's available, is very useful in those situations. I have had situations, though, where that wasn't readily available. And I have actually done a lot of basic education with those patients about calling their, their personality disorder what it is and what that means and why they act the way they act. So for instance, I have a very long relationship with a, a young woman in treatment who has borderline personality disorder. And as I would learn things at different con conferences and trainings early on in the process of, of treating her, um, I would come back and I would share them with her and I'd say, well, this is, you know, this is what borderline personality does and, and now you're doing this thing and that's actually typical of people with borderline personality disorder and this is, you know, I think why you're doing it and this is why it's not very helpful in this situation. And so, for instance, people with borderline personality disorder, they tend to um, overly emotionally attach and then so you're the best doctor ever, you're, you're so amazing, you're the reason they're still alive, you know, all of these things, which unfortunately as providers, we have a little bit of tendency to buy into. Um, and then something will happen and you're suddenly the worst person ever. You don't care about them at all, you're trying to kill them, it's your fault they're gonna end up dead in the street with a needle in their arm. And, and that tendency in people with borderline disorder, borderline personality disorder is to push people away so they reject you before you can reject them. And, and so we'll sit down and with this particular patient, I'd say, wow, you know, you're, you're now saying that you basically think I'm trying to kill you and, and that this is terrible and we haven't done anything for you, but I've, you know, we've been working together for three years now. And remember, this is one of those things we talked about with borderline personality disorder, that sometimes when you're feeling threatened, you react by lashing out and pushing that person away so that person can't, can't reject you. So I'm kind of worn out for today. I can't sit here and listen to you yell at me for another 15 minutes, but I also want you to know that I know when you come back next week, it's going to be better and you're going to be past this. And you don't have to be afraid to come back because I know this is your disease that's acting out and this is, you know, this is a survival mechanism for you. And we're just going to move right past this. So I'm done with it for today, but I can't wait to see you again next week because I know this isn't really you and this isn't really what you mean to do. And that's been really effective in managing her over the years. Okay, we have another question. Any other questions, Marie? Yes, we have one more question. Okay. Um, how do you work with patients who have been on opiates long-term without um, any incident and have not used illicit drugs and are resisting any changes? So I'm assuming that that question refers to uh, pain medication that's prescribed by a provider. Yep. Okay. So the first thing I do is address that, that end of the question that says there haven't been any negative consequences. So I look at the amount the patient's on. If they're on two Norco a day, I'm probably going to save my energy and I'm probably not going to do much with that patient. Um, but if they're on like 300 milligrams of morphine equivalency daily and they say, well, this has never hurt me. <laughs> I, I actually take a step back and I say, well, I'm, I'm not sure that's true. We, we know that you're not addicted. You're not misusing them. You're not taking them for other things than pain. But let's look at the physical consequences. So I also do a lot of chronic pain management. And I start with a very thorough history of their pain and really pinpoint what we're treating. Because much of the time, the original injury or problem or pain that we think we're treating isn't really the pain the patient's experiencing anymore. 
Um, we also then look at all of the medical risk factors. So I run an overnight oximetry. If they're on methadone, I get an EKG. I get a DEXA scan if they've been on them for years um, to look at bone density. And if they're men, I get a testosterone level. And I don't try to tell the patient, oh, these are harming you, you just don't realize this. What I say is, these are the common physical harms that people with who are using high doses of opioids experience, in addition to um, depression and, and uh, cognitive fogging, if you will, and I ask questions about those as well. I ask questions about their function because in my experience, patients who are on high doses of opioids are almost non-functional. Um, if you really sit down and have them talk about their day, they basically don't get out of their chair, they don't do anything. There are rare exceptions to that, but it's not common. And so I, I lead them through this, and then I take them back with the results, and I say, wow, your bone density is about, you know, it, it's, you know, about double the increase of, of hip fractures that you should have because of the bone density loss from, from opioids and other things. And your oxygen levels are, you know, you, and I have seen patients satting in the 60s for long periods overnight. Um, for, for those of you who are not medical people in terms of understanding those numbers, that's basically like somebody suffocating you all night long. Um, and, and if it's an issue, if they're on methadone and we get an EKG and look at their QT interval um, and look at those things and I sit down with them and I say, wow, in these couple of areas, like your testosterone level or this or that, it doesn't look too bad. But in these other areas, this is actual physical harm that's happening to you. We have to, we have to learn how to address that. I also talk with them about the fact that the impact of opioids in their brain is the same as the impact of heroin and how that increases the number of pain receptors over time so that ultimately for most people you end up having more, um, more pain from the same pain sources because you have more pain receptors and have a conversation around that. I will tell you that my response in terms of pain improvement with buprenorphine is mixed. In about a third of those chronic pain patients that are on quite high levels that we transition over, they have amazing pain relief, even on once a day dosing. And, and say, why didn't somebody do this for me years ago? I feel so much better, my brain's so much clearer, my pain is actually better, I'm more active, this is great, you gave me my life back. And about a third of patients, they tell me this is crap and it doesn't work for pain at all and they're miserable. And about a third of patients say, eh, about the same. It's not really great, but it keeps the edge off. Um, so I don't, I don't have a consistent way to predict who's going to think it's good for treating their pain, but, but we do have very good response in some people. And most people, if you stop arguing about how opioids are bad or how we're not just targeting them because we think they're an addict and you actually look at the medical markers of disease complications from opioid use, oxygen levels, um, EKG if it's methadone, bone density, testosterone levels, you have a much stronger case and they're much more willing to listen. I've had many patients who are on both opioids and benzos who get that oxygen level back and they look at it and we talk about what it means and say, you know what, I don't really think I need that benzo after all or that sleeping pill. Can we try to get off of that? Like voluntarily want to get off of it when they see what their oxygen levels look like. So another uh, question. Um, so this is going back to a previous question and just digging a little bit deeper. Um, so for patients who have continued use of both heroin and buprenorphine, is there a greater risk of overdose for those patients who are, who are continuing to use the two substances? That depends on the situation. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through a couple scenarios on it because it's not an easy question to answer. So buprenorphine binds to receptors in the brain more strongly than heroin does and is less activating. In theory, that means that if you use your standard dose of heroin on top of having buprenorphine on board, you're actually at slightly less risk of overdosing because many of the receptors in your brain will be tied up with buprenorphine instead of the heroin. And buprenorphine has a very, very low level of respiratory suppression associated with it, which is how people actually die from heroin overdose. They stop breathing. Um, so in theory, if you slip up and use heroin while you're actively maintaining and staying on your buprenorphine, there is less risk of death. 
On the other side, if you deliberately stop your buprenorphine like two days before because you know you're not going to get high from the heroin and you're planning it, you want to get high, there's actually a somewhat increased risk of death associated with using in that situation because you've lost some of your tolerance to heroin and you're taking it in an unprotected environment. So it's, there isn't a simple answer to that question. It depends on exactly how you're using them. I, I have heard anecdotal stories of, of somebody who was in treatment who was around somebody who overdosed and did not have Narcan available and they stuck a couple of their buprenorphine strips under the person's tongue and reversed an overdose that way. I would never recommend that as a standard of treatment, but it makes sense from a pharmacology standpoint when you think about how buprenorphine works and how heroin works. So it depends. Great. Are there any other questions? Feel free to type them into the chat box. So Marie, while you're wrapping up, I will tell people that my slides are available and you're welcome to use them and modify them in any way that you like. Um, the, the analogy of diabetes and addiction is not um, specific to me. It's one that many people who work in this field use. It kind of, it, it makes so much sense that many of us have sort of developed it independently over the years and it's becoming the more dominant narrative in that field. So, so that is not anything I can claim um, independent credit for. It's common now. Feel free to use and modify the slides and, and spread this information in any way that you like. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Stockton. This, um, Oh, we have one more question. Okay. And then, and then we'll and then we'll wrap up. Um, what about patients who are on uh, four Norcos per day for 15 plus years? Is it better to transition them to sub subutex? Subutex. Okay. Subutex. So, what I would say is, if the patient does not have medical complications from their opioid use. So they're not hypoxic at night. They're not, um, they're, they're not severely osteoporotic. Um, they don't have a markedly suppressed testosterone level. And they have good function with the treatment that they're on now. So they're able to complete all their ADLs. If they're working, they're able to continue working or are meeting their other daily obligations. And and they're not depressed, not having a lot of problems with anxiety, other things that would indicate mood disorders from the opioid use, then there isn't really a good reason to change them. They don't have a use disorder and they are getting the effect from the treatment that we're shooting for. And you would almost certainly be better off focusing on smoking cessation for that person who almost certainly smokes because chronic pain is as actually uncommon in non-smokers. Um, so you'd almost certainly be better off focusing on smoking cessation in that person than fighting about making a change to a medication that they weren't engaged about. Now, some people will have heard that they get better pain control with it, or there's less mental fogging and depression, those types of things, and they might be interested in changing, in which case, absolutely, that's reasonable to discuss. But, but we're running the risk of conflating physical dependence on opioids for pain when that treatment is actually working well in that person with addiction or use disorder, which is not the same thing. So, so no respiratory suppression, no other medical complications. They're on 40, I'm assuming they're on 10 milligram Norcos, so that would be 40 morphine equivalents daily, which is well under the, the kind of monitoring cutoff doses that puts the patient in, at risk of not getting them filled at the pharmacy or gets puts you at risk of being monitored by the DEA, and it's effective in managing their pain and allowing them to have good quality of life, I wouldn't fight that battle unless the patient wanted to, and then I would help them try and transition. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Stockton. We really appreciate it. Um, so just a reminder to all of you on the call, this was recorded. We will be posting the recording on our website. Um, there's also additional webinars um, for some of our other content areas. You can check those out at our website at www.chcf.org slash CIN. Once we have that webinar link live, I'll also be sharing it via email with you all. That will include Dr. Stockton's contact information if you want to reach out to her directly. So thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day.